Hey, it's Brandon, and I'm excited to announce that we're doing another apologetic series, this time on Noah's Ark in the Flood. With every generation, fewer and fewer people believe that Genesis is literal history. And probably the most controversial story of all is Noah's Ark. Most people think that it's just basically legend or allegory, and that sadly includes a lot of Christians. Now, if you've been told all through school and the media and elsewhere that basically the earth and all life on it is billions of years old and there's no evidence to the contrary, then I get it. It makes sense. But that's not the case. And I believe that the best way for you to strengthen your faith and be able to better defend it is if you have or understand the external verification of the biblical account. Now, if you believe in the historical miracle of Jesus Christ, that he came to earth, died for our sins, and was risen again, but then had your question whether God could use supernatural events to have a worldwide flood, then we're not being very intellectually consistent. But as I said, if you don't have that other information, it makes it kind of tough. So I've done the heavy lifting. I've looked at resources such as these and compiled them, and I'm going to bring it to you. We are going to cover the historical and anthropological uh, support of, the Noah, of Noah's account. We're going to look at the feasibility of the ark in terms of function. We're going to cover the evidence from geology, biology, and paleontology that supports Noah's ark in the flood. In a lot of cases, the flood model actually fits the data better and answers questions that plague the secular scientific models. But you wouldn't know that until you get into it. Right? Now, we're going to bring the science, but please don't let that intimidate you. I promise there's not going to be a paper or a quiz at the end. Right? You don't have to remember all the details, but I promise you're going to walk out of the talk being more assured in your faith and have at least some information to be able to answer the critics and the cynics. So please join me February 24th, March 3rd, and March 10th from 6.30 to 8 to be drowning in proof. We covered the historical and anthropological evidence to support Noah's flood as an actual event, and then we dis discussed the feasibility of the ark as a vessel and its ability to, to fulfill its purpose. So if you missed it, you can go back on Facebook or YouTube and check that out, but it isn't necessary to follow most of everything we're going to discuss tonight. As important as the volume and design of the ark is, that's only a part of the story. This is a worldwide event. And there's a lot more to discuss than just a large and in-charge floating barge. What about what's going on outside of the ark? So let's get a better idea of what the pre-flood world might have looked like, because that will help us interpret the evidence of how the catastrophe of the flood played out beyond the confines of the ark. As we discussed, there, is one, there was one single continent, one that had a warmer and more consistent climate than what we have today. There's an abundance of paleontological evidence that the Earth used to be warmer and more uniform in climate than it is now. Such evidence is found in the Mesozoic and Paleozoic deposits. Even mid-Cenozoic deposits include tropical animals and plant fossils in the Arctic, so that suggests a milder and uniform climate. There are also large fossilized trees and coal deposits on the North and South Poles. So how can lush vegetation grow where it has been dark for six months and that cold. That implies either the region had either been more temperate latitude previously or its current location had much milder climate in the past. So plate tectonic theory holds that they were in their present location at the time of the forest growing. And then after that, the earth cooled down. But this supports the earth was, a warmer, was warmer before the flood and then cooled off after the flood. The idea of a supercontinent goes beyond just the, beyond the shapes of the continents fitting together. The geological column and strata, fossils, mineral deposits, and even the magnetic rock record of the rocks all line up across continents, but not in the oceans in between them, because the ocean rock is younger. Evidence of shared volcanic activity across 
across continents also suggest that Pangaea was originally split apart by huge magma, magma plumes that made a continental rift. We mentioned Pangaea, but Pangaea is actually not believed to be the original continent. The Appalachian Mountains give us some context here. Now, first, you need to keep in mind there are two basic methods for mountain building. Continent to continent plate collisions. Plates crunching together and pushing up like in the Himalayas. The other way is continental to ocean plate subduction, where the ocean plate slips, one slips under the other, and a giant wedge of sediment is scraped off at the subduction zone and builds up. This is associated with more volcanoism. The, man, the uh, Andes Mountains are a good example of that type. Okay. Um, and I think we have another slide that shows kind of that graph a little bit more. Okay. Um, the Appalachian Mountains are uh, continent to, maybe it's later. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Okay. The Appalachian Mountains are continent to continent plate collisions, but they're an old range and show tons of erosion, and they're not on a current zone or plate. So it's been, de it's been determined that the Appalachian Mountain range was present at the time of Pangaea, yet the Appalachians have marine sediment on top of them. As we'll mention many times later, that, that sediment is explained by the flood. And remember, the Appalachians are continental plates crashing together, not an ocean plate subducting and leaving uh, marine sediment being scraped off. So, there is one, so this is one example of evidence that Pangaea was not the pre-flood supercontinent. The pre-flood supercontinent was Rodinia. The prevalent theory is that Rodinia broke apart, the plates crashed together to form Pangaea early on in the flood, and then broke apart again. Now, scientists can puzzle together and realign the initial flood deposits on the continental crust fragments from various plates today, and much like they did, to, they did for Pangaea, they did that to determine Rodinia. Now, the secular timeline and the causes for Rodinia are certainly different, but that's the gist. Some think that the flood boundary in the geological record, when we see the change from pre-flood rock to flood sediments, is around 700 to 740 million years ago which approximates the breakup of Rodinia. More commonly, the Precambrian-Cambrian border is cited as the flood boundary, which is more around 540 million years ago, at least in old Earth time. Okay, we would dispute the time, but still. Okay? Now, that seems like a huge discrepancy, but the Precambrian period by secular old Earth time represents 88% of Earth's natural history. So in actuality, in deep time geology terms, those things, those things are relatively close together. And the Precambrian-Cambrian border is marked with a great unconformity. What is that? It's an erosional event. An erosional event that spans the globe. It is said to span anywhere between 120 million years to over a billion years of time that was eroded or wiped away. It's missing. It divides rock sediments that have a lot of fossil animals above from rocks with no fossils or only cyanobacteria below. Now let me say that again for more layman flood terms. The pre-flood pre rock, the rock w that was there presumably at creation, more scientifically referred to as Precambrian, is divided by a worldwide massive erosional event that then has tens of millions of fossils of every kind of animal imaginable buried upon it. This evidence can't be refuted by secular science. It only has to be explained away as something other than the obvious. So as we just said, Precambrian rock is before the flood. Most of the pre-flood rock has no life, and the only pre-flood fossils are cyanobacteria, which are kind of like algae, and stromatolites, which are tiny creatures whose shell skeletons supposedly amass to form limestone deposits. Both of these live near hydrothermal vents in the ocean. Precambrian rock is dominated by magnesium-rich limestone, which is precipitated by vents and sedimentation, versus calcium-rich limestone, which forms a different way. So this refutes other explanations for, for these fossils. Now, while secular science would say that since we only um, have evidence in the Precambrian for these simple life forms, that's all that existed. The creationists would assert that there were plenty of things alive, that was just the only stuff that got fossilized. 
even normal sediment runoff from the pre-flood supercontinent could fossilize bacteria at the bottom of the seafloor. But above the seafloor, we would expect there to be several different ecological zones, just as there are in the world today. There, the general model for the pre-flood Earth is dinosaurs and gymnosperms sperms, living in, the, in swampy, warmer lowland, mammals and angiosperms, flowering plants, um, living or filling the ecosystem higher up. Note that the River of Eden, with dividing into four, may hint at such a topography flowing away from where man was and into the lowlands and into the sea. Now add to this two rather unique ecosystems. The, stromatic, the stromatolite hydrothermal reefs on the edge of the continental shelves that we just referenced, okay, that made the limestone. One could speculate that they even uh, protected the coast, creating a lagoon effect. The other is a floating forest that needs some explanation. But these two unique ecosystems were buried first. The floating vegetation biome. Many plants found in coal have hollow trunks and roots, which basically means they were giant water trees. Such roots would be crushed if they were in soil, because they're hollow, they would be crushed. Okay? They keep water plants buoyant. Water plant roots, like rhizomes, become so intertwined that they create mats. Smaller, more water-exclusive plants can, can cling to the edges of this growing mat. Soil gets trapped in the rhizomes. It begins getting even denser, thicker, and areas in the center can actually have land plants grow on it. During the flood, these mats would then break up from the outside in, the smaller plants being first, and then the larger tree-like plants in the middle being buried later, which is what we see in the fossil record. Then after that, dinosaurs and gymnosperms in the lowlands got buried, and so on. So, what is, so that is what the pre-flood world was possibly like. And then, the flood, and then the flood came. In quick but surprisingly orderly succession, continents moved, mountains were destroyed, sediments from the igneous basement rock were removed and redeposited elsewhere, new mountains formed. Meanwhile, meteorites possibly struck the earth, volcanoes spewed ash, lava flowed as massive new deposits called flood basalts. Even as ev events unfolded, Many animals and plants were buried and fossilized, not all at once, but sequentially as the process drew them in. This sounds very chaotic, but the evidence indicates orderly sedimentary processes. Okay? It's difficult to visualize or understand changes of this magnitude, but our Earth is a meager remains of a shattered planet. As mentioned, the Precambrian-Cambrian Great Unconformity is widely viewed as the start of the flood. What is really interesting is that there is a second secular scientific observation that most continental drift occurred in a super short time, 10 to 15 million years, which again is a long time, but in old age geology is pretty much instantaneously. This occurred during the Cambrian, as, rare a, as the book Rare Earth, which is not a creationist book, okay, but as the Rare Earth puts it, it is though the continents suddenly became ice skaters, gliding about the Earth's surface with unprecedented ease for a short period before turning to stone once more. Funny how such land upheaval coincides with a massive erosional vent and then is followed by the Cambrian explosion, where basically there is nothing in the fossil record and then every major phyla of life, including several that are now extinct, so more biodiversity than we see today, suddenly appeared in the fossil record. No transitions or ancestors, just all there. This is a conundrum for evolution, but the, but the creationists can point to the sudden appearance in the fossil record as an example of the flood suddenly burying many, burying many types of life. It's getting hard to shrug off all these events happening at the same time as mere coincidence and unrelated, isn't it? Okay. The leading creationist theory on exactly how this happened during the flood is called the catastrophic plate tectonics. Basically, the flood caused turbocharged plate tectonics, the entire pre-flood ocean plates or lithosphere be, being cooler and denser than the mantle subducted under. A giant plank of rock sliding under another, as you can imagine, would cause a lot of friction, and this is normally dissipated. But this time, thermal runaway occurred. If the slab sinking fast enough to, if the slab sinking sinks fast enough to heat the material above it at a rate greater than the heat loss can occur, then that zone is going to weaken even more. 
and that weaker zone, that means the subduction is going to go even easier and faster, which causes more heat. And so a loop is created. Now, mantle rock has some viscosity to it. It has been shown that it can uh, up to, the viscosity is up to maybe as much as 10 times. Okay. So um, this seems plausible. This process has been proposed for more local events, such as ancient volcanoes in the southwest United States. Silica silicate materials, in particular, weaken for more stresses than just higher temps, making runaway easier. There is evidence of huge slabs of rock deep down in the man mantle that are much too cold to have been there for millions of years. If heat, the heat should have dissipated or become more uniform in that time. Perhaps this is explained by runaway subduction. When the ocean plate subducts under the mantle, it pulls or warps the top plate down also, which forms a trench. Volcanoes often form. At the other end, the crack usually has volcanoes form a ridge. This is how seafloor sea spreads. Okay? When these giant rifts of subduction first opened up, cold ocean water poured into the rift to meet the mantle rock, the, the lava in the mantle below. This water was supercritically heated. It would send supersonic, supersonic jet streams into the air, which then fell back down as unprecedented rain. So this explains both the fountains of the great deep opening and the windows of heaven. It's really the same mechanism. The water, the opening of the earth shoots the water up, which comes down as extra rain. Note that this, is, that this huge amount of volcanic activity also likely came with earthquake, earthquakes and tsunamis that also added to the turbulence. The rift system are scars of the great deep being opened. Mineral deposits also change dramatically in the Precambrian to Cambrian border. Changes ex associated with extensive volcanic activity and intense hydrothermal activity. Okay. Additionally, this huge amount of lava would have heated the oceans. All the upsurge of new rock would have pushed the oceans onto the continents, adding, the f adding to the flooding with warm water. And this is confirmed by uh, they measure the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 ratios in the rock strata. Okay? The heated magma and the cooling lava on such a great scale also best explains limestone deposits in the Paleozoic or Mesozoic. Uh, CO2 from the cooling magma, chert, large amount of salt, other deposits, all could have been pre precipitated out of this supersaturated brine. Another question is how all the sediment rocks ended up on the continents when erosion typically ends up in the ocean. Runaway subduction brought it to the continental crust from the trench, scraped it off, and built it up. The speed of subduction dragged or warped the continental crust down, making it even easier to ramp onto the top plate. As the ocean crust rose from that volcanoism, it made the difference even less. Great tsunamis could help push the sediment inward. This better explains sedimentary layers of great thickness, uniform in composition, spanning wide areas, even entire continents, all in the same east-west orientation. Sediments and oceans vary today by direction very locally, but all the flood deposit, these massive deposits, run east to west. Again, this runaway effect applied to many areas. For example, I watched a show on the Weather Channel, and by the way, I never watched the Weather Channel. It just happened to be on where I was, right? So this was God showing this to me. But it said that the Haiti earthquake killed like 200, the one that killed like 250,000 people or whatever, was caused by the islands getting hit by four hurricanes in rapid succession. And it was postulated that that caused so much runoff and erosion that it made basically it lightened the, the earth and it made the plates easier to move. So if four hurricanes in succession could make the plates move, what would Noah's flood do? Thus, in this fashion, the runaway convection tore Rodinia apart. Pieces crashed together again to form Pangaea briefly before splitting up again. It is hypothesized that this also caused the magnetic field reversals dramatically and quickly, not over eons of time. The runaway subduction of pre-flood crust gives enough energy for continental collisions strong enough for mountain building. The other method of mountain building we discussed, how do you get those things colliding together? Conventional uniformitary plate tectonics, secular science, does not have a good answer 
or for the evidence of such violent collisions. Evidence of overthrusts of older rock over newer rock for tens of kilometers. Runaway tectonics best explains mountains being pushed uphill. Like how marine fossils got on top of the Himalayas as, as for as far as 1,500 kilometer fronts. Then, later as the, wat as the flood waters receded, it would have eroded massive valleys and canyons. When all the pre-flood ocean was replaced by the new crust, spreading came to a standstill. Presumably this was around 100, day 150 of the flood when the mountains of the deep were stopped. The new, crust sool, the new crust cooled and settled, deepening the oceans. Then the waters rushed off the continents into those deeper um, uh, canyons, receding from the earth, causing wide-scale sheet erosion that planed off the land surface and left unconformities. The Khabib and Coconino sandstone plateaus in the Grand Canyon show this and are not readily explained by uniform plate tectonics. The existence of minerals formed by high pressure but low temp can also be can't also can't be readily explained by universal plate tectonics. High pressure is associated with being deep in the earth. High pressure associated with being deep in the earth also comes with high temperature, but it's easily explained by catastrophic plate tectonics as they are basically at the core of these massive collisions in these mountain belts, right? Where you have the pressure but you don't have the the temperature down below. Meanwhile, in the water, massive forces are at work. Water moving 200 or uh, 20 miles per hour can cause one cavitation, which basically vacuum ca cavities that then implode. This hammers rock with as much as 440,000 psi, enough to crush rock to powder. And also plucking. A vortex, kind of like an underwater tornado, exerts hydraulic lifting forces strong enough to pick up large slabs of rock. In other areas, extensive amounts of lava flowed from long fissures and formed en enormous deposits called flood basalts, forming plateaus. A notable e example of this is the Columbia River basalt, a series of thick basalt layers covering eastern Washington and Oregon. This, enormal, this enormous deposit of lava dwarfs anything that we see happening today, but it's actually pretty small compared to other f global flood basalts. While all these things happened on an unprecedented scale, that's not to say these processes are unheard of. Research in recent decades reveals evidence for increasingly catastrophic geological processes. In fact, the uniformitarian pro concept of geological processes happening gradually over eons of time, the very concept that put many people's idea of science and religion against one another is becoming progressively minimalized. Now, we'll go into more detail later, but here's a few examples of many NOAA floods. Mount St. Helens erupted and caused a 650-foot wave of mud flows that created canyons and hard rock up to 700 feet deep. In five hours, 25 feet of strata was laid down, contaminating laminae and cross bedding. Again, this is a minor eruption compared to, ev to the activity known to have occurred in the past. In 1966, in near Iceland, the, in the Atlantic Ocean, a new piece of land appeared as a volcano reached above the water and formed the island of Circe. A geologist visiting the island soon after it was formed commented that the process is usually requiring thousands of years happened on Circe in days or weeks. The reason is at least partially apparent. The island formed in the ocean with wave action constantly at work, carving cliffs, beaches, and other geological features. Searchy shows how quickly some geological processes can occur in the presence of an abundance of, wa of water energy and an abundant input of sediment. And this would be the case in a global catastrophe. Now, back to the real flood. The majority of land has sedimentary rock above the mantle rock, which is from shallow water deposits. Volcano eruptions are also widely deposited. The largest volume of fossil-bearing sedimentary layers, including massive amounts of marine deposits, are found on the continents. So it is clear the present continents were once underwater. But now that's what we would expect from a worldwide flood. So marine deposits are in the continental crust, and the sediment in the present ocean bases are all Jurassic or younger. Three possible explanations could be given for these observations, or perhaps all three are true. First, large areas of the continents must have been at low elevation during the catastrophe, forming depressed basins where the sediment was accumulating, 
and then the sediment-filled basins rose after the flood to form land with new mountains. Two, the rock composing the existing ocean floor was not formed until late in the flood. And three, the oldest pre-flood ocean floors were subducted into the mantle. Okay. Again, looking back from a stable world where oceans that s stay in the same place for centuries, it's difficult to visualize or understand changes of this magnitude. Yet there is no known mechanism to explain how the less dense continents could get pushed down for the oceans to cover them. The continents are kind of believed to float on top of right, the ocean plates okay, or the mount. Okay? So there's no, there's no mechanism for that to happen. But during the flood, the new rifts in the ocean would be hot, less dense, and then upswell, for rushing water inland. Now, the flood is just not just laying down sediments, but fossils with those sediments. And we would expect the fossils to have a scientifically sound, logical order of appearance. That order of appearance is the fossil flood order, is the flood fossil order. Dolomites and shallow marine invertebrates, right, the, the, uh, the, the reefs that we discussed, then the floating biomes, and then the low-lying dinosaur and gymnosperm biome, and then the higher ecosystem of mammals, humans, and angiosperms. One feature of the fossil record is the detailed sequence of different types of organisms in the record, like one-celled marine organisms, ammonites, and trilobites in the marine deposits. They occur in a series of zones with slightly different species with each successive zone. Short age geology proposes these zones, at least in the Paleozoic and Mesozoic era, resulted from a sorting process in the flood rather than from evolution. For example, as waters reached progressively higher ecological zones or biomes, they killed and, foss and fossilized different types of organisms found in each zone. This would be especially true for the upland vertebrates whose environments were the last to be uprooted from the catastrophe. Now, please understand this. This isn't changing the order of the fossil record. We are just in reinterpreting why the order in the fossil record exists. The fossil record is, to show, is said to show the order of evolution in life. But by definition, all the fossil record can show is the order of death and burial. Here's an interesting fact that most people don't discuss. Note that often an animal's fossil tracks appear way before the animal does, separated by as many as 20 to 70 million years. Why do they not appear together unless the animal was escaping burial? For just one example, the Coconino sandstone have crossbeds. For years, it was thought the area was formed by basically desert sand dune hills. Now, there are vertebrate footprints on, in the preserved sand, but modern studies have examined salamanders and newts walking on dry sand versus underwater. And it turns out all the tracks were made by amphibians walking in water, not a desert. And not only underwater, but against current, as in maybe trying to be, escape being swept away. The fossil tracks in the sands also dis disappear without turning around, as in some cases the amphibians stopped trying to walk and just swam off. An alternative theory for marine fossils is that changing chemistry, temperature, or turbidity in the water could have killed different types of organisms at different times. Similarly on land, susceptibility to air quality from volcanic activity could have had an effect on the order of death. Certain animals would have been more susceptible and died sooner than others. Right? Another factor is, hydrona is hydrodynamic forces are influenced by diameter, density, and sphericity. Okay? So this would sort out particles in the water. So it should be no surprise that the, easy, the earliest strata fossils trilobites, brachiopods, are streamlined and dense. Nor should it be surprising that throughout the record, there are examples of similar body plans sorting out about the same time. The general trend in, fossilization, in fossilization could not only be determined by the original ecological zone, but also behavior and mobility of the animal, whether they're prone to stay put and hunker down under stress or migrate. The first vertebrates in the record are fish, because they were pretty much already underwater, they were already down there. The very, very first fish in the record are armored bottom dwellers, who likely clung to the bottom. They mostly appear in the Devonian and great fossil graveyards. Okay? Then other fish, then the land vertebrates, amphibians and reptiles come next, and they are viewed as less adaptable and mobile, and again, they indeed appear next. Mammals are considered more adaptable, and they appear next. 
humans being among the last. Birds are highly mobile, and they can fly and also float under debris. They also appear very late. Now, of course, these are general trends, and there could have always been local exceptions. And I find that the flood personally explains the these or I personally I find that the flood better explains these puzzles. For example, how do you get a bird that appears in the fossil record before the theropods that they supposedly evolved that that supposedly evolved into birds appeared? Okay. Well, a bird could have been unlucky and got buried earlier. Okay, evolution has no answer for these anomalies. They have to come up with um, you know, other explanations as why they were, you know, how the rocks sorted and shifted to get the, the bird to show up that early. Okay. Large dinosaurs are abundant in the Cretaceous period. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry, let me say this first. The, the same, at the same time land, land animals started being fossilized is the same time we start seeing massive plant deposits that make the coal seams, right? Plants can't really escape. The floating plant biome, biomes likely sunk in mass earlier, being covered by marine sediment. This explains how marine fossils are found within the coal seams. And it also explains multi-strata tree trunks. There are fossils, like tall trees, that span multiple rocks, rock strata. Each rock strata supposedly represents thousands or millions of years, yet the same tree fossil spanned that entire time and didn't erode or break down and became fossilized. Large dinosaurs are abundant in the Cretaceous period, considered the peak of the flood. Now, sea levels have varied throughout Earth history, but they rose during the, deposi the deposition of the Cambrian, reached the height at the end of the Cretaceous, and then dropped rapidly in the tertiary rock units. People debate over the amplitude of these rises and falls, but it's speculated that as, at its peak, sea level was 100 meters to 350 meters above current sea levels. So this lines up with aspects of the flood theory and coincides with the mass extinction of the dinosaurs. Presumably the largest, strongest dinosaurs could withstand being swept away, but even eventually, even by the end of uh, the period, even they gave up or had, to, uh, had succumbed. During the Paleozo Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Early Cenozoic, the humans and other modern types of animals must have been living someplace where fossils are not forming. Now, this is somewhat analogous to the colocanth fish that were thought to have been extinct 65 million years until living specimens were caught in, in 1939. They were not living in situations conducive to fossilization until the entire Cenozoic period, and yet they clearly survived that entire time. This illustrates how one common criticism of young Earth science that dinosaurs and humans were not buried together so they didn't exist together is an argument from silence. Neither are humans and crocodiles fossilized together, or humans and geco trees, or humans and colocants. Knowing if floodwaters peaked on day, one, on day 40 or day 150 would help interpret flood deposits, but the general trend of sea levels line up with the historical record. Just because one is found in one environment and one is, um, oops, sorry. There's a debate on when the flood stops in the geological record. The earth was dry where Noah disembarked, but that doesn't mean flooding and sedimentation wasn't still going on elsewhere. Our volcanic activity still wasn't happening. But this makes it harder to say exactly where the geological boundary is. Obviously, it makes sense that the majority of the sediment had to be the flood event. You can't have more deposits after the flood than, than the major catastrophe that rewrote the earth. So the post-flood line can't be too early in the geological record. Okay? One proposed boundary is when we see a change from more global sedimentation in the Mesozoic to more regional patterns in the tertiary. Paleozoic and Mesozoic sedimentary deposits generally cover widespread spread areas with individual deposits ex extending over 150,000 square miles or more. Then in the Cenozoic, there's a change to more local basin filled deposits between newly forming mountain ranges. Similarly, a major or worldwide volcanic activity has to have died down, and that's what we see in the tertiary. The upper tertiary is also where we see more uh, mammal diversification within kinds. Horse evolution, for example, is speciation within a kind that resulted after the flood. 
A number of other groups of mammals illustrate the same trend from small, generalized forms in the early Cenozoic to larger, more specialized animals towards the top of the Cenozoic. Many types of mammal footprints are also found in the Cenozoic. One might ask where at least not some mammal and bird tracks in the flood deposits uh, were in the flood deposits and lower in the geological column. Well, perhaps there are. Some bird and mammal tracks are found in Mesozoic deposits, and there's at least two papers in paleontology literature that report fossils that look just like bird tracks as early as the Paleozoic. But birds didn't exist then, so they were labeled just merely as unidentifiable tracks. The best evidence seems to place the post-flood boundary at the Crustaceous and Tertiary. So let's talk a little bit, a little bit about the flood a bit more, about the end of the flood a bit more. So once the major activity is over, the new world must be reborn. And that includes a lot of things going on outside the ark, because not all life was in the ark. The Bible says only animals with breath in its nostrils went into the ark. So that excludes all insects, fish, and of course plants. Another common criticism is that all marine life couldn't tolerate the mudslides and mixtures of salt and fresh water when their ecosystem was destroyed by the flood. Now, there's some accuracy in this. It's probably the case that most of the types of marine animals did not survive. At the phylum level, marine life is more diverse than terrestrial life. Yet there are only a couple hundred thousand aquatic species versus millions of terrestrial species today. So this can be interpreted as uh, marine life was much more di diverse and abundant, but only a remnant of what was before the flood survived to speciate compared to terrestrial life. However, despite what they say, many fish can adapt from salt water to fresh water if given enough time to acclimate. Just because one is found in one environment and one in the other doesn't mean they can't live in you know, a, a, a mixture. Uh, they can't live in the other. And while a number of organisms that can tolerate the full range of salinity is small, many can tolerate a decent range of, of the spectrum. There seems to be a sweet spot about one-third normal salt water that most can tolerate. Some studies suggest that saltwater fish do better in fresh water in higher temps and when calcium presence and calcium salts are present, both of which were likely during the flood water. And of course, it goes back to what we talked about last class, individual tolerance and post-flood evolution. Some salinity tolerance has been observed to occur in just a few generations. Some species that aren't very tolerant are still closely related to those that are. And of course, it's also hard to say what the salinity of pre-flood really was. Further, flood waters could also have been strat uh, stratified in their salinity. Uh, some fjords, for example, have much higher salt levels. So there could have been pockets such as these during the flood. On the matter of plants and insects, spores, nematodes, things like that could be airborne. Insect and other eggs were likely in the water and then also attached to debris. Seeds can float for over a year and they could also catch a ride on debris. Again, there could have been individual hardiness and post-flood microevolution micro factors. Other seeds may have sunk only to be exposed as water and land separated. Floatsome rafts of, of debris could have included not only seeds, but vegetation starts, rhizome, rhizome roots, living insect or insect eggs, even nest of ants. Floatsome has been observed at sea for months. Even kelp has been found to have seeds as a stowaway. Note that many of the seeds that seem to germinate as soon as they get wet are crop plants, and these are the seeds that would have been carried within the ark. The flood was not just a sedimentary event, it was also an erosional event. Seeds buried in a dark, low oxygen environment with the sediment would have been later exposed as l new land masses form and erosion occurred. Vegetation, pro vegetation propagation can also occur after burial with subsequent exposure. Olive trees can sprout from a single piece of bark. And by the way, there was enough time elapsed from the time that Noah saw the mountain peaks to the dove bringing a leaf back for this to occur. A more nuanced criticism is pollinating plants would have been not been able to be reestablished without their insects or other symbionts. But this overlooks the fact that most all pollinators have other ways to produce. They can or will self-pollinate or wind pollinate, just at slower rates than what they had their insect help. Here also, the more closely related symbiosis seen today 
is clearly microevolution and maybe even occurred later. As we previously discussed, the Bible says the ark landed in the Ararat Mountains, not necessarily on top. Note that at the time of disembarkment the ark from the ark, waters elsewhere could still be raised for months, years, or decades after the earth resettled. But mountains dry, the, the mountains, dry, besides drying faster, would also provide ecology niches and allow more diversity out of the gate. There are further questions from skeptics about what would happen after the animals disembarked. For example, what would all the grazers eat once they landed on a barren earth? A common assertion is that the lions would have eaten all the horses, deer, etc. as soon as they got off the ark and then they would all be extinct. Okay. Plants are starting to grow, but in the meantime there likely would have been a lot of fungi. Seawood, seaweed would have certainly been in abundance. Carrion could have been unburied. All these, all these limit the need for predation immediately after the flood, which supposedly led to, all, to extinction. Large cats have been known to choose carrion over ha having to hunt. Fish populations naturally would have exploded. Many animals would have been noted to switch to one of these diets, even if it's not their natural preferred one, but they won't starve themselves. Okay? Again, hardiness of individuals, and this is a disaster situation. Insects, flies, ants, worms, rodents would have exploded and possibly became part of the food chain very quickly. Skeptics will also express disbelief in repopulation from a single pair. But, that is, but there are many studies and examples of populations from a, fa a founding pair. Think about islands, right? Especially if there are no competitors or predators, populations will explode. But for examples of small numbers exploding, the collared dove was introduced to England by two pair and turned into 19,000 in nine years. Five cows became 1,500 in, 16, in 60 years on a barren island. Okay. Now, yes, there would have been animal inbreeding in the fa founding pair, the same as it with Noah's descendants. But here again, we can assume that God made sure that the pair were comprised of a strong, diversified genetic stock, two that could have yielded a lot of combinations from alleles moving forward. A quick population explosion would have mitigated prolonged inbreeding. Okay. Uh, look at macaws in the Mauritius Islands. They were likely, likely one pair were brought there by Dutch sailors 400 years ago. Studies of, my, of their mitochondrial DNA passed through the mother has low diversity. Yet on a DNA level, on a nuclear DNA level, the parrots have more heterozygosity in their alleles than other wild populations of animals. Okay. So we'll go into more evidence of rapid speciation later, but for now it will suffice to point out that anecdotally examples of speciations within a generation or two for, uh, for uh, chicklids uh, rock wallabies underwent speciation in a matter of decades based on founder effects. Okay. When animals disembarked on a completely new earth, there would have been niches conducive to rapid speciation. While Ararat was peaking out, surely other things going on elsewhere where the water had not fully receded, leaving regional variations and unconformities. There have been observed examples of isolated new volcanic islands being completely recolonized within 50 years. There are cases of animals, including large animals, swimming, rafting, or being swept by storms across water to virgin land. Further, it's becoming increasingly accepted, but still kind of poorly understood, that environmental factors can induce more mutations. So the founding pair will speciate and diversify more quickly um, because of those environmental factors. Some believe that there was only one ice age that occurred more or less immediately after the flood. Now, secular models have many over thousands of years, but uh, again, the, there is one after the flood, and that the conditions for the ice age were what precipitate were precipitated by the flood. Volcanic activity coupled with the mantle opening warmed the oceans. The heated oceans, which is measured by O2 ratios in shells from the crustaceous and tertiary, caused huge amounts of evaporation that then precipitated the snow on the continents. The land in the intercontinents would be relatively colder, causing snow to be dumped. But on the coast, the warmer oceans would have created lots of rain in a warm, uniform climate along the continental margins. As the oceans cooled, there would have been less precipitation and things dried out. But in the meantime, before things dried out, this might explain, for example, how in Abraham's time the Dead Sea was well watered, or how Canaan which is now a desert, was described in the Bible as a land flowing with milk and honey, or how even the Sahara Desert originally had rivers and forests. 
The heavy cloud cover in the warm oceans and barren land would provide reflective properties to keep the sun from melting the snow off in the summer. Volcanic activity in, from the flood also created particulates in the air, contrib contributing to so cooler summer temps, so the snow isn't going to melt off. Okay? And we know there's evidence of lots of volcanic activity in the ice age sheets. The Nor northern hemisphere experienced the year without summer in 1816 on account of volcanic activity. New England had every snow had snow every month of the year. This was caused by eruptions in 1812, 1814, and Mount Tabora blasting in 1815. It cooled the planet by three degrees Celsius. It is thought that if there is just one or two more eruptions around the world, we might have had another runaway event. We were close to another ice age. Okay. I should point out that a major criticism of this theory is that too much volcanic activity would create greenhouse gases, which would warm the planet. But there's also a debate, a lot of debate, amongst various secular scientific models on just exactly how the Ice Age happened as well. And we do know there was lots of volcanic activity at this time. Ice sheets on the edges then advanced and retreated. Now, this is often interpreted by mul as multiple Ice Ages by adherence to uniform long ages, but the flood model says this is just the ebb and flow of one Ice Age. It is, it's it is speculated that this occurred around 500 years after the flood until the oceans gradually cooled. The flood, mo the flood model of the Ice Age actually does explain other data better, like ice-free ice driftless zones, like how did parts of Wisconsin basically remain glacier-free for millennia. Okay? In the flood model, the coastlines would have stayed warmer, which is why parts of Alaska didn't glaciate and explains how land bridges for animals are possible at this time. It better explains how reindeer and, reindeer and hippos live together in Siberia. It is also compelling evidence for many large basin lakes, how these mega lakes, like Missoula or the Great Salt Lake, which is thought to be 17 times larger than it is now, were filled. And this would require six times the precipitation that we see in those areas today. At its peak, Lake Bonneville covered most of the western half of Utah and parts of Idaho and Nevada. It was 325 miles long and 1,000 feet deep in its central position. Later, these dried out. Okay? It even explains Niagara Falls erosion. The falls erode four to five feet a year. Regression to its current position is estimated to take seven to 9,000 years. Now, that's awfully young for uniform models, right? But it's still not within a flood timeline. But with Ice Age melting and increasing volume of runoff, you can get that number down closer to 4,000. Such a changing climate is, is expected to initiate microevolutionary changes in the animals. However, mammal fossils do not show any such change during the cycles of glac glaciation. The tar pits in Southern California sh show shifts from basically dry shrub to snowy pinyon pine forests at the peak of glaciation 20,000 years ago, and then back to dry shrubs. Yet none of the common Ice Age mammals and birds show any change over the last 30,000 years of geological time. As we'll discuss soon, speciation happens much faster than evolution says it does, and yet there seems to be not enough time in the Ice Ages for, the, for any such changes to occur. Well, maybe they were really short Ice Ages. The Pleistocene clearly represents events that occurred after the flood. Changing climate led to glaciation, and then the climate warmed up again. At the same time, the Earth's crust was readjusting to the glaciation. Okay, so the tremendous amount of weight pushed the Earth's crust down, and after, after it melted, the Earth rebounded. This created elevation and sea changes, which can be seen even in archaeological uh, evidence in the last 2,000 years. Additionally, Earthquake magnitudes have continued to be reduced as we measure them. It's as if the Earth is settling back into place from the catastrophe. In the post-flood world, many groups of animals were able to survive, but many of other groups of animals and plants probably did not survive the, smoor, the cooler portions. Right. So that, in a nutshell, is the prevalent working theory on the flood that has scientific evidence to support the hy hypothesis every step of the way. Of course, the Bible is a better witness, but again, skeptics are not going to be open to that authority. Okay. Now, let me briefly address an outdated theory that still is often mentioned or cited. The canopy theory was an early attempt to scientifically explain the flood, but is now pretty much defunct in most people's minds. 
This is the theory that there was a huge canopy of water vapor above the earth pre-flood, and God, at a predetermined time of judgment, let open the gates of heaven. This is where all the extra water came, which we determined last week isn't really needed. Now, the basis of this argument is more in, in interpreting the Bible. First, perhaps the firmament above the earth, as described in the creation account, was this canopy. So in one of my earlier talks in the Age of the Universe, we talked about the modern theories about the firmament, firmament and creation. So I'm not going to rehash that here. But the other premise is taken, but the other premise for the canopy theory is taken from a reach in scripture. That there was no rain before the flood. That the earth was watered by some type of mist. And they came to this conclusion, not really on science, but because they interpret the rainbow as occurring for the first time post-flood when it was used as a sign of a promise to Noah. Now, first of all, the greenhouse temps caused by such a canopy of vapor above the earth would basically make no life possible. Further, pre-flood rock appears to have been weathered by rain, so it wasn't unique to after the flood. Another point of evidence, trees buried in flood sediments have tree rings, so if they were there before the flood, they had to have had rain. God and Noah also referenced the seasons, so they were pre-flood, suggesting the climate did change some. But the biggest fatal blow to the theory is that water condensing is an exothermic reaction. It releases heat. The amount of vapor in the canopy needed to flood the earth would create so much heat upon condensation that it would boil the oceans in the process. It would kill everything, including the ark passengers, but not from the deluge. So what about the rainbow argument? Well... Bread and wine existed before the Last Supper. Rocks existed before they were placed by the Jordan. God typically uses everyday things and then assigns them more importance. There's no reason not to think that the rainbow, while related to the flood in connection to rain, was given such new importance after the fact. To my reading, and I'm paraphrasing, but God doesn't say, behold, look at this new thing called a rainbow. He says, hey, from here on, every time you see that, remember my promise. So we have an overview of the processes at work to cause, that caused the flood and a host of scientific facts that make it plausible, at least in my mind, and hopefully now in yours. There's plenty of evidence to prove that gen the Genesis flood and the story of the Bible is possible. Okay? But we're not going to stop there. Okay? We're going to get greedy. See, I don't, want you, I don't want just possible. I want probable. It's one, to th one thing to say it could have happened, but another to know it that it did beyond this standard of because the Bible told me so defense. And if it really did happen, then we would expect to see the effects of it, the evidence for it, and to have to factor it into the, our overall scientific narrative. So we're going to look at a lot of other areas of scientific evidence that not only supports the flood account, but also shows that it's the best explanation for what we observe in the world and in science today. Of course, a lot of people are unwilling to throw away scientific dogma or confront their philosophical bias that influences their scientific interpretations in order to see how the flood account actually helps us make better sense of things. But I presume you're not one of those people. But with this portion, perhaps you can gleam a few things that will help you start to chip away at those biases in someone else. Okay? So this is a good place to take a five-minute break, and then when we come back, that we're going to start looking at the biological evidence um, that is not necessarily, again, focused. It supports the flood, but isn't part of the flood. So let's take five, and we'll come back and do that.
Okay, so since creation, populations that were originally adaptable to high level of genetic info have often divided into a number of highly specialized and less adaptable species. Microevolution, remember, this is in the baremum level, or created kinds and down, actually happens rather rapidly. Monkeys, birds, copepods, moths, all provide examples of being introduced to new geographic areas and creating new subspecies in the span of 30 to 1,000 years. Microevolution and speciation rates appear to be 7 to 10 times faster than the rates calculated from the fossil record as dated by radiometric dating methods. This is a very inconvenient truth for most evolutionists. Ironically, though, creationists are thought to be the anti-evolution people, but creationists can accept the fact of a far more effective and rapid change in microevolution than naturalists do. Again, we just say it's from the kind and below. Remember, this is how we got from the baromims on the ark to the wonderful diversity of life that we see today. These facts are particularly relevant upon disembarkment. Original groups of plants and animals have diversified into vast numbers, vast numbers of species as they adapted to fill a host of new niches after a seriously changed post-flood Earth. When you consider the conditions and compare them to the factors that are known to favor rapid genetic change, we would expect that to be the case after the flood. Abundance of unoccupied niches to which the organisms could adapt and fill. We see this in colonizing islands today, when an open niche and no competition results in large numbers of new species. Examples include fruit flies and honey creepers in Hawaii. Additionally, isolated geographic populations facil facilitate speciation. Note this is also true of aquatic organisms and plants and ter terrestrial invertebrates that would have likely survived the flood outside the ark, but maybe were still in more isolated pockets. This observed speciation is supportedly measured by mutation rates. So let's look at human evolution for a second. Human and chimp mutation rates are listed at 78 to 100 base pairs per generation. On average, your child has 78 more mistakes in their DNA than you do. Now, supposedly, we split from apes seven to four to seven million years ago. Now, we'll discuss how much a mass paleoanthropological timelines are later, but four to seven million years ago. And with that mutation rate, we would predict an about a 11 million base pair difference, yet there are 26 million base pair differences. So the mutation rate is widely higher than any population geneticist figured it could be. Now, that's nuclear DNA. You also have mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondria of your cells, and these are only passed from your mother via the egg. It is separate from the nucleus and doesn't combine information from both parents. Because of this, it is considered a molecular clock. While the mutation rate of, of mitochondrial DNA is maybe 10 times greater than that of nuclear DNA, since you only see mutation and don't have recombination from both of your parents, it's easier to follow back for generations. Thus, you might have heard of the term mitochondrial Eve. In theory, since we have all inherited our mitochondria from our mothers, if you go far back, if you go back far enough, you'll eventually get to Eve. Now, of course, secular scientists use the term, but they don't really believe in an actual Eve. But maybe they should. Based on made, known mitochondrial DNA mutation rates, there should be a minimum, a minimum of 21,000 base pair differences between humans and chimps. A max of nearly a half a million, but a minimum of 21,000. But the observed difference is 9% of that, only approximately 1,500. A better example may be supposedly the Neanderthal and human split, supposedly at 400 to 700,000 years ago. Rates would predict a minimum of 955 mutations and a max of 9,211. A minimum of 955, only 213 are seen. So again, evolution timescale doesn't fit the observed mutation rates. But you know what does? The Bible. Mitochondrial DNA fit rates fit well if you place the, darts, the start date of Eve at around 6,000 years. And that isn't just true for humans. Mitochondrial DNA mutation rates in many species fall much closer to the 6,000 year start date that would be expected by creationists and don't fit the evolutionary scale, which would predict 5, 20, or 100 times more than what is observed. MT and DNA relationships also support the Bible dispersion, or the Babel dispersion. 
There are three major nodes of relationships. Basically, the three wives were the three sons of Noah. Many other ethnic groups are attached to one or th one of those node, three nodes, but they do not commingle. So in other words, the Babel dispersion, each group is attached to one of the sons, and they are isolated from every, the other two. The amount of mutation among the nodes is less than the splits post-flood. In other words, there was less time from creation to the flood and the dispersion than there, there was from the flood to now. Okay. So mitochondrial DNA vastly overpredicts, nuclear DNA underpredicts, and both vary in the magnitude of their miss. Natural selection can't be used to explain how this is happening in both directions at once. That's another inconvenient truth, uh, inconvenient line of data that gets swept out of the rug by secular science. Nuclear base pair differences push the chimp human ev evolutionary split back to 11 to 17 million years ago. So if we push the line back to account for the DNA difference to make the mutations rate fit, it'd be further back to 11 to, million, 11 to 17. But that only exacerbates the, in, the mitochondrial problem. Okay? It would make the discrepancy even larger. Pushing the split back also means you have to push off other splot splits in the, prim in the primate tree, back by double. So a macaque and an orangutan split is now at 75 million years. But the, early primate, the earliest primate fossil, any primate, is supposedly 55 million years. So you can't have a split 20, mil 20 million years earlier than that. So stepping back and taking a bigger picture view, what does these mutation rates suggest? The majority, it suggests that the majority of the genomic differences are the result of heterozygosity, diversity, in the original founding pair, not mutation. It is also rest interesting to note that heterozygous, more diverse chromosomes, somehow induce more mutations. It is this heterozygosity differences in the, that is the starting point that allowed for the amazing speciation post-flood. Chromosomal recombination and gene conversion can increase genetic diversity beyond the simple four chromosome pairs of their parents. But the diversity we see is because of the hardiness of stock in the ark. Animals at the bareman level had the genetic potential to produce all the lower levels of genus and species associated with its kind. And we see that play out. There are far greater numbers of breeds than, the, than within species, for example. There are 850 breeds of horses across only four species. Now, Darwin used this as evidence to destroy the old creationist, creationist idea of fixed species. But again, that was that confusion between species and kind. Remember, the Bible uses kind, which is at a minimum the, considered the family or order level. Others say genus. But Darwin didn't see the contradiction in his ways, because this also destroys his time scale and, per, and his proposed trend. We have produced thousands of supposed uh, breeds in our supposed 12,000 years of domestication. Just think in your lifetime, the number of new dog breeds you've heard of, new types of vegetables or seed in your garden or daylily variety. But in contrast, there's only been a, a, but a tens uh, of species in millions of years. As you go up in classification, just as breeds dwarf species, so do, so do species dwarf genus, and so on. There are only 1,300 genera. The the sorry, 1,300 genera are contained in only 200 families. So super fast breeds or speciation suggest most all evolution is a recent occurrence. The upper classes show little change and remain fixed, but small, smaller classes move towards hom homozygosity not heterozygosity. As an animal fills a specific niche, which is how speciation works, does it become more unique or more general? If you wanted to separate a Great Dane from a Pomeranian, you would select very specific traits and remove the conflicting ones. So you can kind of see how we got a mini dachshund from a wolf eventually, but does anyone think you can get a wolf from a dachshund? Evolution says mutations constantly event and create new life forms, new changes that are continually added to biodiversity. But the history on life shows a very different trend. You start with a generic prototype, and, that, and the diversity comes from specializing, 
accentuating a particular variation or trait at the expense of losing the potential for other variations. The history of life on Earth is more inconsistent with what we would expect to have happened from the ARC account. On both the geological and paleological level, we also see a historical record that requires an expl explanation beyond the slow, gradual, secular scientific thinking. The description of the divisions of the geological column were done largely by creationists, sorting out the flood. Neil Steenson's proposed superposition of sediment layers in 1669, but only thought it was the result of Noah's flood. Now later, the theories around the observations changed, as we pointed out in, in uh, on other talks, Lyles and others championed the slow, gradual forces of uniformitarianism in geology, and which was what influenced, and that was influenced by their atheist worldview. Historical analysis of Lyle's work has concluded that the ca the catastrophes, the, the the people who believed in catastrophe in Lyle's day, were more unbiased and careful observers than Lyle's. Yet the timeline made possible by Lyle and his corp and his cohorts remains the dogma today. In 1968, a geologist named Shoemaker recreated photos of the Grand Canyon taken in, the, in an earlier study, 97 years earlier. When he compared the two sets, there were virtually no change in most of the photos. Rocks were in the same place, had the same cracks in them than the, as they did in 1871, except for one part in a branch in the Grand Co Canyon showed dramatic change. A large volume of rock was removed from along the river and other large new deposits appeared. What was the cause? A single flash flood. He wrote a paper called Nothing Happens in the Grand Canyon Except During a Catastrophe. Carlton Brett wrote this, Accumulation of the permanent stratigraphic record in many cases involve processes that have not been or cannot be observed in modern environments. They, there are extreme events with magnitude so large and devastating that they have not and probably could not observe, be observed scientifically. I would also argue that many secessions, however, show far more lateral continuity and similarity at a far finer scale than would be anticipated by most geologists. Okay. Now, what Brett and other scientists, they're not interpreting the evidence as part of a global flood, but they are simply recognizing the nature of the evidence does not fit with gradualism and that nothing happens except for in a major catastrophe. As we have touched upon before, we've seen examples of catastrophic processes reshaping the earth very quickly. Mount St. Helens dropped 600 feet of rock layers, different sediment layers, lava flows to mudslides. It produced many fine laminae, layers supposedly representing a year, kind of like tree rings do, uh, do for, um, uh, tree rings represent a year for trees, okay, kind of the same thing for rock, okay. It produced many of these layers, supposedly in a, in, in a single eruption. The Little Grand Canyon is 1 40th the scale of the big one. There's a stream at the bottom of that canyon. Now, if it wasn't observed to be created in a matter of days, every person who knows anything about geology would have said that stream eroded that canyon over millions of years. But they'd all be very wrong. The stream was just a byproduct of a cataclysmic event. Later on, we'll look at how the actual Grand Canyon is similarly a product of a larger uh, cataclysmic event. But there are some other examples. The Canyon Lake George, Gorge, sorry, the Canyon Lake Gorge, in the, Gua the Guadalupe River in Texas, flooded its reservoir and carved a canyon 50 feet deep in places. The Wikipedia entry noted that normally such a canyon inferred to represent slow, persistent time. But because many of the geological form formations of the Canyon Lake Gorge are virtually indistinguishable from other formations attributed to long-term processes, it lends further credence to the hypothesis that some of the most spectacular canyons may have been carved rapidly by mega-flood events. Walla Walla, Washington. This canyon formed in six days. Another major river canyon in Iceland, 300 feet deep, was carved by extreme flood events from a volcanic eruption in a glacier. Each event eroded as much as 1.2 miles of canyon through bedrock in a few days. Now consider an event from the past, Lake Missoula. A glacier blocked the Clark Ford River and created a lake the size of Lake Erie and, Ontar and, and Lake Ontario together, reaching 2,000 feet deep. The channeled scab land in eastern Washington was carved when the dam burst. Bedrock was cut into valleys. One canyon is 50 miles long and 900 feet deep. A delta 200 
miles in size ended up in the Pacific Ocean. The water took two weeks to drain and went, o and went over waterfalls thought to be five times the size of Niagara. The water flow was estimated to be as much as all the rivers flowing in the world today. But in two weeks, a major area of the state, 16,000 square miles, was formed. When Birch proposed the theory in 1920, he was laughed at because uniformitarianism dominated thinking. It took another 50 years for it to be accepted, and now it is one of those acceptable exceptions. But let's extrapolate that concept out to other plates, places. Some of the great straits, like the rocks of Gibraltar or the Bosphorus and Dardanelles, are, crystal, are crystalline rock all eroded in a V-like notch, as, if it, as, as would be predicted if the Atlantic spilled into the Mediterranean or the Mediterranean spilled into the Black Sea. An area of more than 20,000 square miles in northern Arizona and southern Utah is carved into a series of gigantic steps dropping down from the south. Now, when rivers erode, they don't make staircases. They form valleys with cliffs or ridges on both sides of the, of the river valley. So how can a normal erosion carve the steps of the grand staircase? This calls for eroding water flow on a grand scale, like the runoff at, from the end of the flood. And a grand scale is indeed required to make most of sense of most of the Earth's past. The tremendous extent and other unique features of many Paleozo Paleozoic and Mesozoic deposits are so out of character with the uh, environments that occur today that they beg for a very different explanation than can be supplied by modern analogs. In contrast, um, the North American sedimentary formations in the Cenozoic, remember that is post-flood, are more localized, for example, basins filling between mountains or in river valleys. Okay? In the western part of the United States, the Jurassic, the Jurassic era Morrison formation covers an area from the Canadian border almost to Mexico. Many dinosaur specimens have been found in the Morrison formation. This formation is interpreted as fluvial, river or floodplain, and or lake deposits, with fauna rich in dinosaurs. A catastrophic or global geology history seems to offer more possibilities for explaining these widespread deposits. Nothing remo remotely resembling widespread deposits is forming in the modern world in these environments. At the base of the Cambrian is a quartzite that is found almost worldwide, typically followed by other uh, metamorph sandstone, coarse grain sandstone, and then finer sandstone. At the base of the Ordovician, are prominent quartzites found in many parts of Europe and Africa and possibly more widespread than that. In the Devonian, there are continental ridge, stone, con so, sorry, continental ridge sandstones that extend from eastern Canada all the way to Iceland through northern Europe and Russia. The Mississippian, that's an era, not a state, red wall limestone is prominent cliff forming uh, layer in the, the, is a prominent cliff, cliff forming layer in the Grand Canyon. But that same type of limestone and fossils are found through much of North America as far as Alaska and across Europe into Asia. Pennsylvania coal deposits, again, era not state, deposits are similar in eastern North America to Russia. The Triassic British sed sedimentary layers found in eastern North America, across Europe, Mexico, China, and South America with similar characteristics. These are examples of the same rock layers across the world, yet discontinuous in the record. While, uh, or sorry, there are other examples of the same rock layers across the world, yet discontinuous in the record. The white chalk beds that make the White Cliffs of England also go into Eastern Europe, Turkey, Israel, Australia, and the Southern U.S. Other layers are fa similarly found from the U.S. to Europe to Russia. And it isn't that these are just amazingly widespread, but it was also that they were deposited rapidly by, rapidly by water. So the moral story is, what could have made all these types of deposits worldwide by water? Clams and corals are shallow water coastal organisms, but their fossils are found across entire continents. Not on the ocean crust, but they're not on the ocean crust. The obvious answer is the ocean crust was not where the continents flooded. That suggests the supercontinent. So not only is there plenty of evidence that catastrophe and other processes 
that are not seen happening today are responsible for much of the geologic record, it has also been increasingly shown that processes and observations that are frequently attributed to long age processes can also occur much faster and also be explained by catastrophic means. In fact, so much so, it's now thought that, as Derek Ager points out, that, quote, sedimentation of the past has been often been very rapid indeed and very spasmodic. It has more effect than vast periods of gradualism. Now geology says there are more gaps than the actual record. A catastrophic event leaves a record, yet secular science insists there were eons of gaps in between. But that begs the question, how do we know what is not there? Where are there were there really eons of time if there is no record? All we have are catastrophes, unquote. I would add. All we have is one really big catastrophe. Okay. So how do we date or measure sedimentation rates? We do it by isometric, is, radio isometric dating the two layers and then measuring the thickness between them and then finding out the rate. Now, I'll cover, I, question, I cover the questions about the, tap, the tactics of radiometric dating in virtually every talk that I do because it's so important, and I'll do that here again later. But let's just say that they have their own list of promise, problems. But based on radiometric dating, sedimentation rates are measured today much faster than historical rates. Historically, the rate is 0.01 meter per 1,000 years. Today, it's 100 meters per thousand years. That's 10,000 times faster today. So that means one of three things. Sedimentation was much slower in the past. Now this defies both uniformitarianism, gradualism, and catastrophism. It is contrary to what Lyle proposed that got us into this mess today. Two, ancient sediments have been lost or eroded, but the erosional breaks, the evidence for this, is both severely lacking and still insufficient. Or three, the, ge the geologic time scale is wrong and is a gross overestimate of time. Take the Paleozoic and Mesozoic sediment strata, which the modern view dates at 400 million, 480 million years old. But if you apply the observed modern rates of sedimentation, it would only be between 4.8 and at most 48 million years old. Now, that's not a biblical time scale either, but if you take modern flash flood rates, so assuming Noah's flood was only the same as a modern flash flood, which deposits as fast as 1,000 meters per year, it would take 8.4 months. Now, in other areas, the strata is much thicker and would take longer, but then again, Noah's flood would have been much bigger in scale, too. So this is just an example to show that the numbers are feasible. The average thickness in Phanozeric sediment on Earth is 4,900 to 6,500 feet. To calculate a sedimentary rate over that time using radiometric dating, the, dis, the, the rate is 0 0.001 centimeter per year. Now that, again, compares pretty poorly to the sedimentation rates of about one centimeter per year in modern deposit basins. So why is the ancient rate so much slower than modern times when we think it was wetter in the past, by the way, by a thousand times slower? If the present is the key to the past, then sedimentation rates through geology history should have been about the same magnitude of modern rates. But if that were true, there should be many times more ancient sediments than what we find in the geologic column. There seems to be far too little ancient sediment. Again, this is explained away by suggesting more sediment was originally there, but most of it was eroded away by the next episode of sedimentation. Our brief episodes of sedimentation were followed by long intervals of activity. So the eroded sediment was not recorded in the rocks. But the missing sediment is hypothetical. Re it's required by geological time frames that are not I but not indicated by physical evidence. This additional hypothetical sediment is not necessary in short age geology. We can suggest the existing sediment is generally close to what was generally deposited, except when there's Obvious, an obvious example of er, er, erosional unconformity. The Miocene-Pliocene Pisco Formation in Peru is thought to span 10 to 12 million years, based primarily on radiometric dates. However, the vertebrates' fossils are generally articulated and very well preserved, indicated rapid burial. Also, where good, out, there, where good outcrops show details of the sediments, there are typically are sedimentary structures that indicate storms and other fairly rapid sedimentary processes that may not require more than 100 years at most for the formation. 
with so many indicators of rapid sediments, where can you put those 10 to 12 million years? There's a Pisco whale fossil that's extremely well preserved. In modern environments, such a good preservation of a whale would require burial within days or months at the most. However, Pisco sediments that entombed the whales were interpreted as accumulating on the seafloor at rates of only a few centimeters per thousands of years. Geologists and paleontologists who studied the whale formation, the fossils, for at least 20 years had not either noticed this glaring inconsistency or had taken, uh, not taken it seriously enough to seek an answer and discuss it in literature. How quickly an animal is buried after death can be esti estimated by the nature of the fossil. Soft tissue degrades in a matter of hours. Think of a jellyfish fossil in coarse, grainy sandstone. It's, it's like putting your handprint in concrete at just the right time. If it's too so not too soft, not too dry. Now imagine hap this happening repeatedly over a million years and over a span of 300 miles, which is supposedly the case in one site. Other examples. In the 1950s, we started to understand turbidity currents. It was assumed that sedimentation of graded layers took years of time and, and gently shallow water to kind of sift out these layers. Turns out giant underwater mud flows known as turbidity currents were shown to sort and deposit graded sediment layers over large areas in minutes, not years, and in deeper water than expected. The turbidity currents laid down meters of sediments in minutes. Sometimes they're like underwater landslides. One in 1929 measured 45 to 60 kilometers per hour and measured 20 cubic kilometers. Another in the Mediterranean Sea was 8 to 10 meters thick and covered 60,000 square kilometers. Some of these landslides have traveled over 20, sorry, 200 kilometers underwater. Now, again, it begs the question, if these, we know these to exist today, then maybe previous even larger ones were misinterpreted. Many, main, uh, many finely laminated sediments are sometimes interpreted as varves, which are like geological tree rings that we mentioned. A pair of varves makes one laminate per of layer, one laminate layer per year. Deposits can often contain many thousands of laminations. The Green River Formation shows millions of annual layers. Okay. But short-age geology theory predicts these varves do not represent annual deposits. Laminae have been shown to be laid down in hours, not in a year. Some evidence already challenges the varve interpretation. In that Eocene era, Green River formation in Wyoming, radiometric dates suggest several millions of years. A large part of that formation is many th has many thousands of years of very thin varves, annual layers. But within these varves are well-preserved fossils of palm fronds across that are several feet across millions of animals including fish large turtles crocodiles bats and a horse these fossils indicate rapid burial there's no reason to think you can cover a fish or a nine foot crocodile with layers one millimeter per year of sediment and still preserve these fossils now it's been suggested that the water was anoxic, no oxygen to decompose. But there's two reasons this is not a satisfactory hypothesis. First, the lack of oxygen does not prevent decay or slow it down significantly. It just changes the microbes that does it. Also, one study in a particular location of the Green River Formation that was a shallow water shore environment had the same excellent preservation and is the same and the, in the same laminated sediments, but that's a near shore environment and could not have lacked oxygen. Okay, so. There are also giant boulders frequently found within the layers of the laminate, and their conditions suggest rapid burial. They would have been eroded down from eons of time if the lamina had built up around them, and that isn't the case. So in the Green River Formation, the varves, pairs of layers, are, are, are also sandwiched between two volcanic events, but the layers don't stay consistent between the two eruptions and vary by 30%. Okay, so again, the varves are not an accurate way of dating. Another issue is the finer detail of the rock, uh, 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 sorry, another issue with finer detail in rock in general is bioturbation. Burying animals churn up the sediment, so undisturbed layers suggest it was buried quickly before the animals burrow onto the surface. Now on a side note, it always is assumed that the animals were burying down into the sediment. What if a lot of the burrowing, burrowing evidence found in rock was animals trying to go up to escape burial? But in the modern world, bio, total bioturbation occurs. If sediments preserved in rock had not been 100% bioturbated, the feature, that feature requires explanation. 
If the beds are completely disrupted by repeated cycles of burying, the bed is considered to be homogenized. In such cases, all the evidence of sediment layers or other internal structures will be gone. Modern studies indicate that homogenization of sediments requires from one hour to one year to a depth of about 10 centimeters. Typical rates of deposition for, uh, uh, deposit um, of depositing sedimentary layers based on radiometric dating values give about one centimeter per thousand years. So supposedly no bioturbation happened in all that time, thousands of years. Sedimentologists who rely on internal structures in the beds to understand processes of sedimentation would have a very hard time doing their research if deposits were laid down as slowly as the dating suggests. Quantification reveals a very different picture. The vast majority of vertical intervals and deposits surveyed had little or no bioturbation. Now, some people use the presence of bioturbation as a reason to rebuke the flood, but these people, one, overestimate the time it takes, and two, ignore the overall paucity of the activity. And so overall, it is far more a plus than a negative for creationists and requires more explanation from long age proponents than from that. From a, from a flood, flood perspective, the amount of activity is most consistent with short periods of time and rapid burial. Moreover, an increasing number of geological phenomena appear ne to need or require the presence of water. Uh, mega brushes of, are sedimentary deposits with angular rocks, called clasts, measuring greater than one yard in diameter, and they occur, and they occur in a matrix of finer material or smaller rocks which may or may not be angular. Uh, Chadwick reviewed the literature on a number of deposits and found that most are readily explained by short age theory. Scientists believe that most of these occurred underwater where buoyancy could reduce the rocks in friction. We also see uh, conical nautilid fossils, a lot of them, as many as a billion, spanning 220 square kilometers in a, la in a thin layer of limestone. They are always found at the exact same level and are almost always found in a northwest to southeast orientation along their long axis. Now, if these animals died and simply fell to the bottom of the tranquil waters, we would expect them to fall in random patterns, and never mind why billions would die at the same time. But these cones are aligned against a strong current where they were buried, again, over a span of 220 square kilometers. The chemistry of the surrounding rock also suggests it would have been toxic to the nautilids, so it was clearly a massive catastrophic event. Large storms can create underwater sand dunes called sand waves. The sand waves are more consistent in slope, quartz content, and grain content to the Coconino sandstone and the Grand Canyon than desert sand dunes would be. This is where we talked about where the, uh, the, the animal tracks were earlier. Labs have determined ratios for sand wave height in relation to water depth and speed and stuff like that. To get a nine meter thick cross bed, you would need water 900, or sorry, 90 to 90 meters, uh, 90 to 95 meters deep, and a water current velocity between 95 and 165 meters per second. Moral of the story is only the deepest ocean currents approach that speed, or tsunamis. Furthermore. The waves suggest a northwest to southeast direction. Here again, the Grand Canyon tells us which way the floodwaters flowed. There is no known source to the north for the quartz, feldspar in, in the sandstone, or for that amount of sand grains for that matter. So either a, a tsunami or a strong current had to transport those materials for some length. Here are a few other examples of geological evidence of catastrophe that is hard to explain otherwise. Uh, the Shinnerump conglomerate in Utah. Sand and rounded pebbles resemble a, resemble a river deposit, only it is 15 miles thick and covers 260,000 square kilometers. It's been explained as a stream bed. What stream do you know covers that much area in depth? The, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this, Allure Akos in Australia. Uh, flash floods supposedly carried boulders from mountains that were 10,000 kilometers away and deposited them on this flat area. What flash flood do you know that carries 1.5 meter thick boulders that distance? I can only think of one possibility. Further, there's no sign of long-term erosion. Other mineral and, land and sand suggest it was deposited rapidly. 
The Kingston Peak Formation in California is best described as a, can a, te a tectonic underwater catastro catastrophe, ocean landslides. But there are similar features in the same part of the geological column all around the world. What would have caused a global underwater event? The mega sequences in North America. We see, in sa we see the sandstone in the Grand Canyon, but this is a single body of sandstone from Texas to Canada, California to Maine. So as I brought up elsewhere, what major event have you heard about that could have flooded an entire continent? The Hawkesbury sandstone. Cross beds within it suggest a succession of massive flood waves, tsunamis 20 meters high and 250 kilometers wide, carried billions of tons of sand and dumped it. This created a fossil graveyard of 20 genera of fish, both salt and freshwater varieties, shark, crustacean, and amphibians, all buried the same level in catastrophic conditions. Let's talk about other fossil graveyards. The Cambrian Burgess Shale in, B in the British Columbia, Canada. Here, 120 species of marine invertebrates, having a composite of about 40% mobile bottom dwellers, 30% fixed bottom dwellers, and 30 free swimmers. All lived basically on a quiet sea floor, but were then swept into a basin and buried in a landslide. These fossils have soft parts intact and food in their stomachs. The Ordovician era Sum shale in South Africa. Fine laminated sh shale, again, indicating rapid burial before bioturbation bio could destroy the layers. Okay? Thousands of well-preserved fossils over 1,000 kilometers, square kilometers. Conodonts are soft-bodied verte soft vertebrates, so typically o only very small remnants are left. But there is so much detail here that even their feeding apparatus is intact. This represents burying, being buried alive and fossilized without disturbance again for thousands of kilometers. The, car the Carboniferous Era Monchot Sale. This deposit includes 30 species of plants, 16 classes and 30 genera of animal from sharks to spiders, a mixture of freshwater marine and terrestrial animals being cast catastrophically buried together. The same era Francis Creek Shale in Illinois is a similar mixture of freshwater marine and terrestrial animals. 100,000 species rep uh, specimens, 100,000 specimens repre representing 400 species, 33 classes, 40, 14 phylas. Note that fish and insects don't sink when they naturally die and are typically scavenged or decomposed. They are more likely needed, uh, they, are, they more likely need to be buried to be preserved. The Crustaceous Era Santana Formation in Brazil. Here's an example of the Medusa effect. Seeming, seemingly instantaneous fossilization with details of muscle fiber and hair, structures in the gills of fish that normally collapse only one to three hours after death, here they remain intact. This graveyard includes flying reptiles, terrestrial dinosaurs, plants, insects, spiders, fish, crocodiles, marine invertebrates, all instantaneously buried and killed, buried and killed together. Uh, a formation in Mongolia is a formation of uniform sandstone. All the fossils had to be quickly buried in coarse sand. Large mammals and dinosaurs were buried alive, some in the struggle and death struggle poses. There are plenty of other examples where mollusks, whales, and marsupials all buried together. Millions of fishes, all facing more or less the same direction. Okay. Dare I say, almost all the most amazing cases of preservation come from these rapid, incompre incomprehensibly large catastrophic burials. So there is no dispute in the order of the geologic column or the majority of fossils within it, just interpretation. The relative time sequence of the record is acceptable. The actual time frames and the mechanism causes or causes are the point of dispute. So next week we're going to get in a little more detail on the fossil record and offer rebuttals against the older timeline that says that Noah is a myth and yes, we're also, I, I, I've, I've been waiting, I, so I've waited to the last to make you keep coming back. We're also going to discuss what happened to the dinosaurs. Okay? So thanks again for coming. A few minutes late, but thanks again. Again, if you want you, the, uh, a copy of my talk, you're welcome to put uh, uh, your name up here, and I'll send an email to you. i got a couple of the resources that I use. We can talk about those or any other questions. But otherwise, thanks for coming. We'll pick up next class.